Hi, so, yes, my name's Oliver Gibson, also from the, the University of Brighton. I'll be presenting some data that's going to compare different methods of, of heat acclimation. Um, quite fortunate that I'm following uh, Professor Sorker. He's already explained in, in great detail. We see initially um, heat acclimation described as a, a phenotypic adaptation. In, in its most simplified model, we combine hot and humid environments with physical work to endogenously stress primarily thermoregulatory uh, cardiovascular and pseudomotor systems. Um, these adaptations, quite nicely borrowed from Professor Sorker, um, have been discussed in more detail earlier in the session. And, and Professor Sorker also touched on this acquired thermotolerance, which we know is a, a cellular adaptation, um, which offers cytoprotection against subsequent thermal exposures. And the 72 kilodalton uh, molecular weight heat shock protein has been pretty well implicated in this process. And we see increased levels um, or increased basal levels of the protein and also an increased induction of HSP72. And it's primarily its induction that we'll focus on today. We know that the extent of the stress and its application are going to dictate the, the integrated adaptation. The first method of heat acclimation um, for this project is a fixed intensity heat acclimation, which in a simplified form has a workload which is fixed, uh, an exogenous environment that's consistent throughout, which gives simple implementation, uh, but potentially various uh, and varying endogenous criteria, and particularly core temperature um, is going to diminish as adaptation occurs. This contrasts with an isothermic heat acclimation model, which has a, a variable workload, um, still in the same exogenous environment, which demands greater um, application from the practitioner, but allows us to impose and control um, our endogenous criteria, and most notably, core temperature. This is a, a figure from a, a review from 2006 by, by Taylor and Cotter, and we see um, on the left, figure A, the various days. So we've got day one, four, eight, and 12. And on the y-axis, core temperature decreasing as uh, acclimation occurs. If we contrast this with figure B, we see the controlled hypothermia model sustaining um, core temperature. The aims and, and the content of this presentation is to compare an isothermic and fixed method of, of heat acclimation over a short-term heat acclimation period. Over a long-term heat acclimation period, we're going to continue uh, or, or implement a continuous isothermic model and compare that with a, a progressive isothermic and a, a fixed model of heat acclimation. And the data will consider the administration of, but then also the physiological and, and thermoregulatory responses. Um, we're also going to utilize uh, the cellular stress response uh, to determine the levels of endogenous strain between the methods. And due to the innate differences between the protocols, a, a sort of day one to day 10 as it is, um, comparison isn't possible. So we're going to compare the efficacy of the, the heat acclimation methods on performance during heat stress tests, and, and these would be our, our predominant variables. Um, brief hypotheses were that the rate of adaptation over a short-term heat acclimation period wouldn't be different. Um, as we extended towards a long-term heat acclimation, we'd see the rate of adaptation attenuating in, in the fixed model sustained in a continuous isothermic and potentially advanced in a progressive isothermic. Short-term heat acclimation was five 90-minute exposures in a, a, a very warm, very uh, humid environment with the normal experimental controls. Fixed participants were required to exercise for 90 minutes at a fixed intensity of 50% of their VO2 peak, so their power was maintained throughout. And this contrasted the isothermic group who sustain, or sustained a 90-minute exposure starting at 65% of VO2 peak, but we targeted a, a rectal temperature of 38.5 degrees and then made power adjustments once that um, rectal temperature had, had been made. No distinct differences between the participants. To note, uh, and we've got a, a slightly higher end for this short-term heat acclimation um, group in the ISO, um, in the ISO group, and that's because we subdivide after the short-term heat acclimation period that into a continuous and, and progressive model. This is quite a nice figure that takes the mean um, relative exercise intensity for the, the fixed and the ISO participants, um, and we've got a, a mean over the short-term heat acclimation period, and we can see the sustained 
workload in the fixed, and then an initial higher intensity that uh, becomes reduced towards the end of a session in an isothermic model. If we first consider the administration, um, we see roughly uh, a third of the exercise in duration, or the third of a, a duration of the session is spent exercising in ISO, and this contrasts with almost 100% of the fixed session. The mean exercise intensity, um, and perhaps this reflects the, the point Professor Sorker made earlier, um, is more sports specific, so we're seeing a greater specificity, certainly if we look at um, percentage of VO2 peak from the ISO than the fixed, which is typically lower than you'd probably prescribe for um, training or competition. And notably, if we consider this of, as implementing um, heat acclimation prior to competition as part of an athletic taper, um, the work is less in an ISO model. Mechanistically, the, the responses, um, we see a greater, about a quarter of a degree, um, rectal temperature in ISO and a greater rate um, in ISO in comparison with fixed. We're also more consistent with our temperature targeting in the isothermic model. If we take um, the 38 and a half degree marker, we're seeing an approximate 40 minutes per session in the ISO model at that target rectal temperature. Um, a fixed model only gives us 20 minutes at, at that temperature. This additional, or the differences, is, is not a consequence of, of any increased physiological strain, um, which when expressed as a mean, shows a, a balance between the, the methods. Long-term heat acclimation was 10 90-minute exposure, so an additional five. Um, fixed participants continued with their fixed workload. The ISO continuous group continued to target 38 and a half degrees, um, and an ISO progressive for the final five sessions targeted an increased rectal temperature of 39 degrees. And again, no distinct differences between the, the groups. And again, we see a similar pattern where the ISO models um, have got an elevated exercise intensity that, that diminishes with the session. If we consider the administration over a long-term heat acclimation period, we see similar data to the short-term heat acclimation where we're seeing um, more favourable exercising durations and more favourable exercise intensities. If we then make a comparison between the isothermic continuous and isothermic progressive uh, models, we don't see any difference in work, and in fact work is now equal between all methods due to the ongoing adaptation um, to achieve long-term isothermic heat acclimation, you need to increase the amount of work to make that uh, target rectal temperature. Again, we saw greater targeting and more consistent targeting of rectal temperatures in the ISO models, although there's no difference between those two. And with, again, the only difference between the ISO models appears to be the effectiveness of targeting um, rectal temperatures. Um, and that's true of the, the 38 and a half degrees and, of course, the 39 degrees, which is most effectively targeted in the ISO progressive model. We used HSP 72 and the, the leukocyte mRNA expression to determine um, the endogenous strain experienced by participants. So, here, this figure relates to short-term heat acclimation, and we've got day one, pre and post the 90-minute session, day five, pre and post, and then equivalent for the long-term heat acclimation with day one, pre, post, contrasting day 10, pre and post. The first observation is that each session was transcripting HSP 72, so for session one, five, and 10, we're seeing an increase. Probably our most interesting finding um, from a cellular perspective was that we saw an attenuation of that increase um, post the fifth and the tenth day in fixed. We think this is indicating the reduced endogenous strain, and data from a, a previous study shows that that to be equivalent to a 10 degree reduction in the exogenous, the external environment. And this is telling us that the isothermic um, is more capable of potentiating a consistent stimuli for, for adaptation. The last data relates to the, the heat stress test, which Jess described earlier. Um, first data we've got here for short-term, then long-term heat acclimation for rectal temperature and heart rates at rest. Suggests that there's an earlier adaptation using the, the fixed model. This contrasts peak rectal temperatures and peak heart rates 
um, during short-term and long-term heat acclimation where isothermic models appear to be more favourable um, for, for an, um, representing perhaps a, a higher exercise intensity. There doesn't seem to be any benefit from using a progressive isothermic model. If we consider sweat rates, um, we see they're again more rapidly augmented in an isothermic model um, over short-term heat acclimation and long-term heat acclimation. Um, we see no difference between the methods. From this data, we conclude, yes, that we're seeing um, phenotypic adaptations over both long-term and short-term uh, sojourns. Perhaps um, this data reflecting fix is more favourable or reinforcing that fix more favourable for, for resting measures, isothermic perhaps for higher intensities. There's no benefit from using a progressive isothermic model. And we think that the isothermic model is therefore more appropriate for training and competing in the heat due to reduced work and reduced exercise durations and a more optimal uh, sport-specific exercise intensity. And that's due to the more effective uh, endogenous strain. Um, I'll close by thanking Aspatar and the organisers for, for uh, facilitating this presentation and my colleagues at the University of Brighton and, and the University of Bedfordshire. Thank you. From this project, we were just measuring the mRNA, so we weren't measuring total protein either in the, the leukocytes or, or any other tissue in the body. I think had we measured it within tissue and, and the actual protein gain, then I would anticipate um, an increase in, in basal levels because we were just looking at the expression of the mRNA, then it appears that that increases and then returns um, from the completion of a session to the next one the, the following morning. Okay. Another question? It was very, very nice. And uh, at least one of the, the more striking things in, in looking at your study is this, uh, it was really interesting that you, you change, when you change the intensity, I think that it was ranged from about 65 to 75 percent with your isothermic. And it gets back to you want a model if you want to acclimatize for sports. Different sports have different intensities, as Lars showed. You know, you're, you're down and you're up and, and that. So if you're going to truly adapt to sports, it seems that type of a model with your changes intensity, much like um, some of the groups in Australia have shown with physical training, is that is if you change the intensity and, and, and you force the adaptations, perhaps with a burst, maybe filling of the heart and some of those types of adaptations and things like that, you may actually be able to get a much better uh, sports-specific uh, acclimatization. So it'd be interesting in the future to, to, to fiddle around more with, I guess, bottom line is with intensity changes yes, and sure. not maybe wet, worry as much as core temperature, but follow the sport. Uh, just a quick question. Um, great presentation. Thanks very much. Um, with your fixed workload uh, protocol, can you start looking at uh, the questions about um, changes in metabolic rate with acclimatization? Or is it a change in mechanical efficiency maybe for some reason? Um, yeah, our, our participants were not um, regular accustomed cyclists, so it could be that, that that was occurring and that might affect their relative um, intensity. And I think that's true of, of the, the metabolic rate. I don't think from this data we could... Right. Did you measure VO2? Uh, not not oh. during the test, yeah. So. Oh. Any, any more questions? We've got time for a Swifty, as it were. Okay. Okay, thanks very much, Charlie.